Great, I can't see any of you. This is perfect. That's how we do. Um, like Barbara, I was going to bring a, a prop up on stage, but I couldn't fit a printing press in my pocket. I'm just happy to see you all. All right. So, uh, this is Johannes Gutenberg. He is not a rebel. There's not even any way you can imagine him being a rebel. And he certainly did not mar mean to spark any kind of rebellion. By all accounts, he was a proper God-fearing German. He saw the printing press as solving a need, his need to put food on the table. But the legacy of the Gutenberg press is one of science, war, Oh, God, you, you guys are slow. Let's try that again. The legacy of the Gutenberg Press is one of science. Oh, so much better. Thank you. Uh, war. We can do war. And uh, fomenting the spread of illegal ideas. I can get behind that one. Uh, like I said, Gutenberg was about as rebellious as a slice of Kraft cheese. Not only... Uh, so he didn't invent the printing press, and I'm sorry to tell you that, Europe. Um, the printing press was, uh, well, let's go start here. The oldest known printed book is a 17-foot-long scroll of the sacred Buddhist text called the Diamond Sutra. It was commissioned by a Chinese, a Chinese man named Wang Jie in honor of his parents. Hi, Mom and Dad. No, they're, they're here. Hi. Uh, in, in 868 A.D., uh, it was printed using wooden blocks, which had to be carved just for the Diamond Sutra. Within 200 years, page books had replaced scrolls in China, and a commoner named Pi Sheng invented movable type. Uh, not the website. Jeez. People are terrible. Uh, instead of one large, uh, one large block per page, he figured out how to carve each Chinese Hansa character onto its own clay block. By the 12th century, the Chinese had moved from clay to bronze. By no later than the late 13th century, Koreans had started using screw presses and metal movable type. And by the late 15th century, Gutenberg's time, metal movable type was widespread in China. So what the hell are we celebrating with Gutenberg? Well, he did a little bit. To answer that question requires a bit of background. So he was born in Mainz, Germany. He started his adult life as a merchant, but quickly moved to blacksmithing and goldsmithing. He and his family were exiled from Mainz in 1428, and they landed in Strasbourg. Gutenberg spent his 30s there goofing off, uh, um, experimenting with xylography, or as most people know it, printing with wood blocks. Despite innovations elsewhere, at the time, it's still the dominant form of printing in Europe. Europe had other stuff going on, like the Black Death. And killing each other. And just like marijuana leads to heroin, Gutenberg's xylography addiction gets him into typography, which is a far better way to print written words. Gutenberg spent his time in Strasbourg refining his metalworking skills, mostly by making what's known as holy mirrors. You point these things at Christian relics, the mirror both reflects and absorbs the light, ensuring that the holy light heals whatever ails you. And I, I'm sorry, I don't think that's how that works. That is indeed science. Strangely, holy mirrors turned out to be a financial disaster for Gutenberg, not because the Christians surrounding him knew what was going on, but because most Christian pilgrims were told to stay put to stop the spread of the bubonic plague. <laughs> they just couldn't get their healing light. So while he's messing about with mirrors, Gutenberg was also making advancements in printing. The first, connection, the first mention connecting Gutenberg to printing actually appears in a 1439 lawsuit against Gutenberg by the family of his dead business partner. Whole nother story. That's like two other talks. Anyway, the lawsuit cites movable type, Gutenberg's type mold innovations, and metals to make the molds. Some speculation that I encountered in my research indicates that uh, Gutenberg and his partner were printing or trying to print religious indulgences, which they would sell and the sinners would feel like they'd been absolved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Gutenberg and his partner were very secretive, and there's just not much that has actually been confirmed. 
So it's here that historians speculate that Gutenberg made his innovations. His background as a smith led him to science up. Uh, good, thank you. It was a stretch. Uh, an alloy from lead, tin, and antimony, which became the basis for sturdy, reusable, movable type. And to create this alloy, Gutenberg invented a matrix mold for creating uniform type blocks. Once you have standardized type blocks, you can move them around much more easily. That's essential for mass printing the standardized alphabet in use in Europe. He also created a new oil-based ink, longer lasting and better suited to his alloy type molds. And although Gutenberg didn't come up with the idea of using a press to push the type into the paper, it wasn't a stretch for him. Europeans had been using screw-type presses for olive oil and wine for hundreds of years. Once you have the type and the ink, the process of applying them to parchment or paper became as labor-intensive as turning a handle. Okay, it's still a little bit labor-intensive, but anyway. You'd think with all this innovation that Gutenberg couldn't fail. Boy, he failed. He was heavily in debt, uh, and he heads back to Mainz around 1446 and enters into a partnership with a wealthy goldsmith and financier, Johann Fust. Their goal was to mass produce Christian liturgical manuscripts without losing any of their color or design. Why waste time with tiny little indulgences when you can just print the damn Bible? So Gutenberg borrowed 800 guilders, around $100,000 in today's money, from Fust to set up his printing press. Uh, Fust comes calling for repayment in 1452. Uh, but the big G doesn't have the money. So they agree to another loan, but not only does Fuss give him another 800 or so guilders, uh, Fuss is now an official business partner of Gutenberg's. A few years on in Gutenberg heralds, the modern era of poor business decisions by uh, erstwhile publishers. <laughs> While working on the Bible, Gutenberg has been printing indulgences to make money in, in the meantime, but not enough money. Fust wants his 2,000 guilders back, Gutenberg doesn't have the scratch, and the courts boot Gutenberg from his own business, and he's left bankrupt. Uh, Fust is sort of our nominal villain, um, unless you like books. Uh, the Gutenberg Bible wouldn't have happened without him. A year later, in 1456, Fust and Gutenberg's acolyte from Strasbourg, Peter Schoffer, published the first of 200 or so 42 lion Bibles, what we now call the Gutenberg Bible. Uh, it cost about three years worth of a clerk's salary, um, sort of like today's iPhones, and <laughs> fuckers are expensive. <laughs> 48 of the uh, Gutenberg Bibles still exist today. Uh, the British Museum has helpfully scanned a few of them online. If you want to play with them and see how they're different, you can do that. Uh, but unlike printing in East Asia, which chugged merrily along for hundreds of years, mass printing sets Europe on fire. Maybe not the best. Book euphemism. Various workers who helped Gutenberg in Mainz basically steal his technology and spread it across Europe, hoping to become printers in their own right. Within 50 years, right by 1500, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Brussels, France, England, and Germany all have their own book publishers. One estimate I came across says that at least 2,500 European cities had at least one printing press by the turn of the century. Gutenberg Press came at the right time for European society, um, if you like thinking. <laughs> the Renaissance spread as plague receded, leaving church dogma vulnerable to an increasingly educated populace. As knowledge became more valuable, Europe founded its first universities, further increasing the demand for books. It didn't take the religious uh, elites long to throw a fit. It's no small irony that the Bible would soon be used to spread uh, that the spread of the that the technology used to spread the Bible would soon be used to spread heretical, rebellious ideas. Yay! Uh, Gutenberg died in 1468. It took less than 20 years after his death for the Church to start banning books. Uh, that's a pretty sharp curve. Uh, it started by banning unauthorized Greek translate uh, German translations of Greek and Latin books. Then Pope Alexander VI banned printing and reading of heretical books on threat of excommunication. That wasn't enough. So in 1501, he not only demanded that all book manuscripts be reviewed before publication, and if you know me, you know how much that sets me off, <laughs> but that those already printed be examined for heretical ideas and burned if they didn't pass muster. Fuck that guy. Pope Alexander's legacy will forever be the introduction of book burning to Europe, something they never stopped doing. Fuck that guy. <laughs> Fuck him. Fortunately for the rest of us, enough people felt that Alexander should go stand on his head on a busy street, and they kept printing. 
Martin Luther and John Calvin probably are the most famous of these rebels. Luther printed more than three million pamphlets and books in his lifetime, pushing the sundering of the church from which it would never heal. More than one eighth, the, one eighth of the world now identifies as Protestant, thanks to Luther and his publications. But at the time, Luther's work led to the Thirty Years' War, where Catholics and Protestants did their best to do that other European pastime, exterminate each other. Thank you. The printing press would be the most important tool in kicking off the scientific revolution as well. There we go. Uh, Cop Cop Copernicus's On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres was sort of the velvet underground of its time. Um, <laughs> only 400 copies were printed. It did not sell out, but judging by its influence, Every astronomer and most of the scientists of the age managed to get a hold of a copy, or at least got a hold of the rebellious ideas within it. Um, the idea that the Earth rotated around the sun was so revolutionary that our dear rebellious friend Martin Luther said of this idea, this fool wishes to reverse the entire science of astronomy, but sacred scripture tells us that Joshua commanded the sun to stand still and not the Earth. Whatever. <laughs> bit more than 100 years later, Copernicus's ideas would be dominant and confirmed by Sir Isaac Newton. Science. Newton, that too. Uh, meanwhile, the first printed news account started appearing in the late 15th century. What we would recognize as the first periodical public newspaper was printed, somewhat coincidentally, in Strasbourg in 1605. Within two decades, newspapers had spread across Europe, making printed reading material even cheaper as literacy spread. But it also helped the public engage in civic life as reports of political figures, crime, deaths, and marriages became more accessible. The first newspaper in the American colonies was published in Boston in 1690, and arguably it set the tone for the next hundred years because it lasted one issue. Any guesses why? It was shut down by the British governor for reflections of a very high nature and for failing to obtain a correct printing license. I'll leave that one up there for a bit. Newspapers would become vastly important tools for the uh, colonialists rebelling against Britain. Uh, although they were regional in nature, newspapers were available everywhere to create a national community. The sense that what was happening in Boston mattered to people in Georgia and vice versa, a little bit less so today. Historian Willard Grossvener Blyer wrote that weekly newspapers played their part in developing a feeling of solidarity among the uh, colonists in their struggle against the mother country. Uh, and as a quick aside, I came across some interesting French book banning uh, and burning during their revolution. Um, Including one, including one by the encyclopedist uh, Diderot about a sultan with a magic ring that makes vaginas talk. <laughs> Just did, that's science if I ever heard it. Anyway. So through the founding of the United States, the printing press hadn't changed much from Gutenberg's innovations, but the Industrial Revolution would change that forever. A cast iron press in 1800 made it easier to print with less force required and could churn out 250 sheets an hour. A steam-powered printing press uh, made its debut in London 10 years later, 1,100 sheets per hour. The rotary printing press in 1843 allowed for millions of pages per day. Uh, these new innovations in printing were accompanied by even newer ideas. The movement to end slavery took off with Quaker Benjamin Lundy, uh, who started a four-page newspaper in 1821 titled The Genius of Universal Emancipation. His fiery, outspoken opposition to slavery encouraged other publishers to take a stand, including William Lloyd Garrison, who founded The Liberator, and John B. Russworm, who started Freedom's Journal, the first African-American newspaper in the US. From 1850, more than 200 women's suffrage newspapers would be printed in the US, helping redefine how women were perceived and preparing the country for the eventual passage of the 19th Amendment. Our strategy talk, by the way. Without rings, apparently. Gutenberg's press would continue to fuel rebels and revolutions for more than 100 years, but the seeds of its replacement, our dear currently fucked up internet, were sown in 1844 with Sam Morse's telegraph, and I'll leave you all with its first message, what hath God wrought? Thank you all. <laughs>